I understand that uh, a lot of you, especially students, uh, how many of you are students in the program, by the way? Just raise your hands. So I asked Jeff what you're likely to be doing at some point in your careers, and he said, use a research, one sort or another. And so I wanted to give a talk that might actually have some meaning for you. Um, and uh, that's what I'm going to be covering, is going actually beyond user research. So you may think that user research is something of the end-all, be-all. It's pretty darn important, but um, we're not really done with figuring out the role of user research. So um, let me jump right in and talk about this phrase, you are not your user. And this is something that occasionally we still have to make a point about. But way back when, when I was a grad student, it was kind of a big deal that, oh, you mean I'm not, I'm maybe designing something, I may be running a product or service, but I don't really know what my users want. I'm not them. I actually have to do some sort of testing. I actually have to watch them, listen to them, evaluate them, maybe even, God forbid, talk with them. So um, this is, it, it, you know, it, it's kind of an amazing thing that um, we're still thinking about this, but you know, we were thinking about it about decades ago. And I, I was trying to think of what was a kind of a watershed event when people really started to believe this. And uh, there's many, and I'm gonna, this is somewhat arbitrary, but I really think of, of Don Norman's book, Design of Everyday Things, which I actually happened to buy for my mom when it came out. Uh, because she was really frustrated with using ATMs and kept blaming herself for not being able to figure them out. Does anybody remember off the top of your head what year this came out? Yeah, top, it, pretty close, 88. Actually, 86. So, those of you who are in this room who've been involved in user research, I want you, and you're over 40, <laughs> I want you to stand up. And here we go with the applause again, please, because thanks to these people, we've won. <laughs> All right. We don't really have to make this point so much anymore. We really have won. It's not quite the same world as it was in 1986. Or again, think of some of the other watershed events, maybe Steve Krug's book, Don't Make Me Think, as really kind of carrying the day and really solidifying this really important point that you're not your user which is essentially the, the main point of doing user research, is to understand that. Okay, so we've won, but well, what did we win? What's the future look like? Well, I'm gonna tell you a story. Um, I um, still do a fair bit of consulting. It still involves a fair bit of user research. Now, you should know my bias. My bias is that I work in la with large, typically enterprise class organizations, Fortune 500s, what have you a lot of the places that many of you will find yourselves quite shortly. And um, let me tell you the story of working with one. You work in today's organization. It's the organization that understands that you are not your user. It's the organization that spends money on user research. Fantastic, that's where you want to be. But this is the kind of situation I find in that organization. I go to these places, usually a, a UX team or a user research group brings me in and they've got some kind of horrible problem and I, I really, I'm less of an information architect these days and, and more of an information therapist. So I try to get them on my couch, I try to hear them out, but one of the things I try to do is say, well, let's look at your user research. And so they start off with the stuff they already have in many cases that they already produce. Um, so they, they might be doing some sort of usability testing, they might be uh, doing some A-B testing, the kind of stuff that you're already aware of. But then I ask questions. So that seems to be good, but there's more, isn't there? And in fact, as you start to scratch the surface, you do learn there's more. One of the things I really like is site search data. That was my last book. And so I'm always asking them, well, do you, do you have site search analytics data? Where is that? Well, yeah, we must have some of that somewhere. But do we get that from the search team or the analytics team? They're not always so sure. And sometimes it can take months of digging to get at that stuff, but you'll find it. And then I ask other questions, like do you have a call center? And what do they know? 
Well, um, with one organization I was working with recently, they said, yeah, we have a call center. We don't ever talk to those people. They're in Omaha. And we don't talk to people in Omaha. So um, it took many months of digging uh, uh, with the contacts in Omaha to find out that they actually could produce logs from the call center that tell you something about what's pissing people off when they call up the uh, support line and what's happening and what you can do about that. Oh, that's another form of user research. Fantastic. What else? Well, then there's the people who operate these tools, the analytics people. And they may be somewhere else. And it's hard to find them and hard to find out what they know about users. So another pocket of user research somewhere else. And in some organizations, then they have another odd animal called voice of the customer research, which is often based on surveys. It's another way to gather stuff that lives often in another silo. Then there's a bunch of people who operate these kinds of tools, like customer research, uh, customer um, CRM tools, what is it? Customer resource management, I, f I forget. Relationship management, thank you. Customer relationship management. Um, they have really interesting stuff that they know about how people are interacting with the, with the organization's products and services. Then, many of these organizations actually have this thing called a research center where they pay people like you, people even more advanced than some of you with PhDs after their names, uh, to do this thing called research, which often involves figuring out what users are wanting, not necessarily today, but down the road. And there's tons of research that I, I've had the opportunity to talk to many people and learn from them uh, who are at Microsoft Research. And it's amazing the disconnect between what they're doing there and what they're actually producing as, a, as products. Now, not, all, not every organization has a research center doing some form of user research, but they all have access to this other really interesting thing called a library or commercial databases that, again, hold another form of user research that's valid and meaningful to the products and services that they are designing inside these organizations, if they know to go look for it. And then, in one situation, I found this really interesting. Um, I was, I was talking to them and they said, oh, we need to show you our mental model diagram. And I'm really happy because I'm, the first book my company published was the book on mental models. Well, awesome. But then I'm unhappy because it's like this thing that's really important and really valuable over there somewhere in a war room inside the, uh, the organization's headquarters. And it's been done by outside consultants at a separate agency. So okay, now you have not only the idea of user research going on in silos inside your contemporary organization, but going on by people that don't even work for the organization that are being brought in. And does that knowledge stay when they leave? And it's not just people doing mental models research. This was something I learned about that I'd never heard about before. So we start learning about user research that is completely foreign to us. In this case, it was something called brand architecture. Raise your hand if you're very familiar with brand architecture. Yeah, not a hand went up. And yet it was a really interesting methodology that they were using to figure out how people related to brands. And then, you probably have heard of this thing, the Net Promoter Score, this, this really huge key performance indicator based on a whole bunch of survey data that, again, not only is managed typically by an external organization of researchers, but the client can't even change the surveys. They can't even really influence it very much, uh, except maybe every year or so, every time a new edition of the survey goes out to customers. Incredible. All right, so this is the problem. These organizations are paying now millions and millions and millions of dollars to people like us to figure out what's inside their customers' heads, what's inside users' heads, and how they relate to and behave when they're using their products and services. And yet, where's the insight? How do you have insight in a situation that's completely siloed? Okay. So I think this is a big problem. And this is, if, if you leave with one thing today from my talk, what I want you to know is that you may, two years from now, whenever it is, find yourself inside large organization X that has drunk the Kool-Aid of user research. 
and you may be looking forward to that experience, but ultimately you might find yourself frustrated if you want your work to have an impact. And when it's siloed off and separated from other meaningful types of user research that are complementary, you may find that your research just sits there in your silo and it stews along with you. So, how do we break out of that? Um, I think, um, as you would imagine, part of the problem comes from people working and collaborating across these silos a bit better. And I'm constantly reminded of this famous uh, fable of the, um, the elephant and the blind men. As you know, uh, if you're familiar with it, uh, a number of blind men encounter this beast. They don't quite know what it is. One of them feels the, the leg and thinks it's a tree. Another feels the trunk and says, no, no, it's a snake, and so on and so forth. That's what we're doing. That's where we're set up. We're each a blind man. We're each using a narrow set of tools, a narrow set of methods that produce a narrow set of data, and therefore, if you can call it insight, very narrow insight that doesn't have broad applicability and robust applicability across the organization and across time. So how do we stop being blind men? Well, um, well, before I get to that, just to reiterate, we can't achieve insight when user research is fragmented and redundant. And we can't justify what we're doing. We're ultimately kind of vulnerable as professionals if no insight is coming from all that expensive work we're being paid to do. And because our organizations are essentially brainless, if you think about it this way, what you guys do as user researchers is increasingly the stuff that drives or ought to drive how organizations make decisions as a whole. You are putting, pulling together the evidence that should dis drive design decision making and design decisions are now the things that are essentially the stuff of what organizations are about, strategy, processes, and so forth, how they work, even in terms of culture. If you don't think about this as a collective way to generate insight, your organization is completely hamstrung. It's essentially brainless, because what we do together when we do collaborate is we are basically the brain for the organization. Okay. So how do we start fixing this problem? How do we start aligning user research across these silos? Well, the good news is that there are a number of dichotomies that are really fabulous, weird but fabulous. Let me, let me, let me run through a bunch of them. One dichotomy is that many of us in the user research world, and I'm using that term obviously really broadly, are really good at figuring out what is going on. So think of like, web analytics people. Your analytics data is the product of users' behavior. It tells you what is happening. It does not tell you much of anything about why. It's all about what. It's awful when it comes to why. It'll help you come up with great hypotheses that then you might exploit uh, user research of other types, like more of the qualitative approaches, user testing, contextual inquiry, and so forth to follow up and answer those tough questions that your analytics people are bringing to the, for, to the fore. So you learn about what is going on, you come up with interesting questions, but you then need to use other tools, other methods to answer why. So that's an interesting dichotomy. Another is this quant and qual dichotomy. And I, I wish I'd come up with this. I really, and I'm, you probably can't read it from where you are in the back, but the quant people are all about numbers and analysis and ham radio skills. And the qualitative people are all about empathy and emotions, and they love glee. <laughs> Maybe this is dated by a couple of years. But there are different, literally different kinds of brains that we bring to the way we understand the world and certainly how we understand how users interact with our products and services. Different brains. Not one of them is the right brain. Not one of them is the perfect brain. You have to have a bunch of different perspectives as you try to solve these, these difficult problems together. Some of us are really all about advocating on behalf of organizations as they try to achieve their goals. So, for example, I'll pick on the web analytics people one more time, or business analysts, and they're very driven by 
goals, organizational goals, often expressed as KPI, key performance indicators. All right, that's good. Someone has to figure out how well the organization is performing and from a context of how users are succeeding or not with products and services. Some of us are actually doing the other thing. We're advocating on behalf of those users. And what's important to them? What gets left off the table when we're only focusing on organizational goals? Another interesting dichotomy to put together. Now, I love this one. Um, a lot of people are really great at measurement but often only at measuring the world that's known. So if you are looking at goals expressed as KPI, if you are really fixated on metrics, that's fantastic. But they've already been established as important benchmarks and important things to measure. But what about the world we don't know? Do you ever take a set of data and not just look at it to understand performance, but to look for weird things, to play with it, and look for outliers, look for surprises, Look for patterns, the things that only will emerge if you delve into the data and talk to people. It's not necessarily stuff that you're measuring today, but it may be the stuff you should be measuring tomorrow. Some of us are really fixated on facts and figures. Others of us are fixated on concepts and ideas. They're very different animals that require not only different brains, but different tools to manage and learn from. Both very important. I've tried to put these things together in, as I've um, admittedly described, my table of overgeneralized dichotomies. But to sum up, how we analyze, if just to pick on web analytics and UX people, how we analyze can be very different, some looking at what's happening and some looking at why. What methods we use, very quantitative methods versus qualitative. What we're trying to achieve, advocating on behalf of the organization versus on behalf of users how we use data to measure performance versus to uncover the unknown world, patterns, surprises, and finally, the kind of data we use, statistical versus um, descriptive or what you might describe as semantic. So I just summed those prior slides up in this table. And um, it shows how different we are, but it also shows ultimately how complementary we are. So that's good. What can we do with it though? How can we actually get these people from these different silos with these different brains and tool sets to actually start to collaborate? Well, it's hard. It takes, I've failed in most efforts I've, not that I've had that many, but I've failed trying. Um, it's really hard to build in the incentives inside organizations for you to succeed outside your silo. Can we make it unattractive to not do this? Can we make it, un can we make it's very clear that your siloed way of looking at the world and how users interact with your products and services ultimately will lead your organization to fail and to place you out of work. Well, one thing is we can actually learn a lot from the data that comes from those other silos. If we can start looking beyond our silo, we can really pick up quite a lot of stuff as well as help them pick up things they might not have learned from the same data. So, this is some of my favorite stuff. This is search analytics data. This comes basically uh, from uh, an Apache log. Doesn't matter really, but it's basically lo we're looking at uh, what someone searched on a website. This is a, a state of Washington website. And what we see is the first thing they did. So we have an IP address and a time date stamp. They searched on Linson's plate and they got zero results. And then a few seconds, two seconds later, same IP address, two seconds later, now they searched on license plate and they got 146 results. I don't really have to do anything right now up here because you're doing it. Your brains on data do really interesting things. This is two tiny lines from a huge, huge, probably many megs of, of data and hundreds of thousands of individual queries and your brains are already figuring out stuff, and in very different ways, and that's the cool part. So some of you are, are looking at it from like an analytics perspective. You're saying, oh, are we converting on license plate renewals? And others may be looking at it from more of a, a qualitative UX perspective and wondering, oh, what are people searching on the most? And there's probably 10, maybe more, reasonable questions that come just from looking at a snippet of data. How many of you are already looking at search analytics data regularly? Raise your hand. Not many. 
But all of you probably came up with some interesting questions from this foreign piece of data that, you, uh, again, most of you have not ever looked at before. All right, so we can learn quite a bit from each other's data. It really pays to take a look. We can actually even improve each other's tools. This is an, a very ugly version of a persona from Adaptive Path. Uh, personas are, as you know, uh, they're, they're essentially, as many of you know, um, uh, essentially the, the uh, idea of capturing uh, an archetypal uh, user from a different audience type. We have a number of archetypes. This is Steven. He's a contractor. I'm not even, I don't even remember what kind of site he's supposed to be using. But one of the things that we see in personas is that they don't always hold a lot of water with some of the more data-driven people because they're fiction. They make us a little uncomfortable by their fictional nature. They're made up. What if you take that and start incorporating real data? Do you have any kind of analytics data, for example, that matches up with the rough idea of that audience segment, contractors, where you can then say, oh, I can, even, I can beef up this persona by saying, what does the guy search based on actual data? There are other ways of taking real data and enriching personas. That's just one example, and it works both ways. It's not just taking data driven stuff and incorporating it into the, the uh, touchy-feely stuff that a lot of us UX people are used to, but it works the other direction as well. Telling stories from data. I can tell you as a publisher that our number two best-selling book is storytelling for user experience, and one of the reasons is people are looking at data and they say, what, what story can we tell from it? And that's been a really valuable thing for a lot of people on both the UX side and the analytics side. Speaking of stories, we can help tell each other's stories. This is um, a screen from Google Analytics. Now, before Google Analytics launched, most of the analytics applications out there were so ugly and in many cases unusable that you never, ever were going to use them if you were not an analytics person. If you're uncomfortable with these kinds of tools, you probably weren't going to bother. But to their credit at Google, what they did was they brought in a team headed by a guy named Jeff Fien. Some of you know who that is. Um, and he took, they took it and basically turned the model on its head of how you interact with analytics data. So a UX group came in, worked with analytics people, and some really basic things like instead of just saying, here's your reports in your face, we'll push them in your face and you figure them out, they framed what they were doing not as reports but as questions like what did users search, visitors search for or where did they search? They frame reports as answers to questions like this. And that's small, fairly simple, but hugely powerful. And now we start opening up our tools in new and better ways to each other when we work together on the tools themselves. We can help e solve each other's design problems. I love this example. Uh, I got this from Jared Spool. Um, Jared talks about working with Land's End and looking at the search logs looking at the data and seeing that a lot of people were searching SKUs, the, I, the product ID numbers, and getting zero results. So it's a good thing they looked in the data and found that there was this critical type of query that was failing and people weren't getting, not only were they not converting, but it's, a pro, it's their own ID number. It's Land's End own, own, own numbers, their own SKUs. So, um, easy thing to fix. They put the SKU numbers in their web catalog so people could find what they were looking for, but then they decided to scratch a little deeper into the problem. And why is it, they wondered, that people are searching SKUs? They're not even on our site. Well, they did a field study and they went into the homes of some of Land's End's customers and as you probably aren't surprised to learn, they found that there people were using the paper um, guides or, or the catalogs that were being sent to them every three months since they were 12 years old. And they're very familiar, easy to use, high res uh, images in paper compared to what people were getting on their computers, pre-retina display days. And um, uh, then taking that SKU and searching the site because why would you want to call the 800 number and deal with a human being who might be pushy or might steal your credit card number or what have you. So taking this field study on top of doing the analytics work and looking at them together painted a really interesting picture of an ecosystem of use that they would not have gotten 
if they'd only stuck to those two tools individually. Okay, we could even test each other's hypotheses. I, this is a messy example, so bear with me. This comes from Netflix. And when I got this example, it's kind of funny how the mighty have fallen. They were seen as a cutting edge company. Pre-Flixster, what was this, two years ago? How the mighty fall? Well, Netflix, I love this because what they're doing is they're not, they, they got beyond the standard analytics reports and they really were thinking about how stuff works from different perspectives where they could incorporate questions not only that the analytics people might have had, but people from other teams that cared about their users. And they developed a simple but really powerful funnel, in effect, that looks at success and, and more importantly, at failure. So let me run you through this. The first thing they're doing, and by the way, you notice this is Excel. I love this. They take the data out of Omniture and put it in little old Excel so they can play with it. All right, people searching. Top searches, click, the departed, thank you for smoking, over the hedge, and so forth. All right, that's great. And they rank them by frequency. So the top searches, the first one was searched over 20,000 times and on down. Then what they do is say, out of those, which ones were actually clicked through? Which ones were viewed? And they come up with these percentages that they also render as, as little bars to show you which were the big ones, like this one, 55% versus this one, which is 9%, only get one bar. So um, they looked at, all right, what's being searched, what's being clicked through, and then what's being added to the rental queue. And they found, obviously, cases of success, like thank you for smoking, it was the third most searched, it was being click through, uh, viewed 24% of the time, and then 10% of the time being added to a uh, rental queue. And then, isn't that wonderful? But who cares about success? What you care about, really, in this context, is failure. Here's a failure. Lost, searched a lot, viewed a lot, 55%. Added to the queue, 4%. Why is that so low? All right. Now you guys would answer this in a lot of different ways because you have different brains that you're bringing to the, the conversation. And um, when I ask this question, uh, I won't do it to, for, to save time right now. I won't subject you to uh, a Q&A here. What people tell me is, well, uh, they might not be stocking Lost properly. Uh, they might not be able to handle TV shows like Lost that have multiple episodes and multiple seasons. Uh, it, it may be a problem with a common term like lost, which might occur in other uh, movie titles and so forth. So now they have a problem, and they can start thinking about what's wrong, come up with a bunch of hypotheses, and fix it. And what's really cool about this is you know about the long tail. Well, this is the opposite. This is a short head problem. And when you fix it, it has a big impact, unlike fixing things out in the long tail, which are more esoteric. So. Okay, uh, I've just run through a bunch of ways that we can actually work together. Um, how do you actually, but how do you actually do this? If you, especially if you, in a year or two, are a user research, researcher at an organization like the ones uh, that I've been describing. How do you actually get that organization to have a brain? Well, let's talk about a few ideas. Um, this one is one of the obvious ones, but I can't emphasize it enough. Um, get out of your, literally, your physical sp space. Get away from your team. Find people at other teams and talk with them. I'm always uh, reminded of the example of a woman named Samantha Starmer, who's uh, an information architecture person who works at REI. Actually, she just left REI recently. When she was at REI, she ended up running the user experience team. And she did this crazy, crazy radical thing. She left her part of the campus, this one building where her team was, and she walked across the lawn to a building where the marketing people were. And they had their own cafeteria, so she sat in it and had lunch and introduced herself to people. She knew no one initially. By the end of that type of effort, she knew a lot of people. She learned a lot about how marketers do customer research. They learn a fair bit about how user experience people do customer research. They're not one and the same thing. 
They're separate blind men. She got a bunch of them to start looking at the elephant together. It can be things as simple as setting up a brown bag series and inviting people and offering to pay for pizza and getting them there and getting them to talk. That doesn't happen overnight. I can tell you from experience, trying to put together groups from different silos all at once is it's just you know, kind of a, a high stakes effort. It's, it's really hard to do, but if you can build momentum over time, you're in a much better position. So get out of your silo. Another thing that I think is really worth considering is um, this concept that Dave Gray, uh, author of Game Storming and this new book, The Connected Company, introduced me to called Boundary Objects. Boundary objects are things that are common to multiple fields. So an example of a boundary object that is common to a couple fields might be the idea of goals. And if you're uh, maybe a UX person, you see things as goals, but your colleagues in analytics see things as KPI. That's a quantitative expression of a major goal. Can you find out? Can you develop, if not common language, a sense of common concepts that are meaningful to you both? So you might call them user segments. They might call them personas. Maybe they're not exactly the same, but they're likely that you're doing enough of the same work that there are enough common activities and common outcomes that you might use different words for better the same thing or similar enough that now you can start building a common worldview, as well as the ability to have a conversation with someone whose language you would not have understood beforehand. So the idea of uh, boundary objects, or Dave actually took it further and he started developing an idea of boundary matrices that contain a lot of different objects. I gave you a URL and I'll put this, this will be up in slides here, this presentation, and I think Jay Jackson will have it as well. Anyway. Um, the idea of going beyond a few things and making it an active exercise to identify a variety of boundary objects. A lot of you guys are pretty amazing at mapping, at drawing, at presenting big pictures of complex spaces. And you should really take advantage of those skills and run with it and try to map the, the world of user research, especially beyond your comfort zone and beyond your silo. Here's an example, and it's one of the ugliest, ugliest things I've ever laid eyes on, and I use it in almost every presentation and probably with every client I ever work with these days. It's by a guy named Christian Rohr. Uh, um, URL's at the bottom. It's also been credited to Steve Mulder and Ziv Yar. In any case, what it is, is a landscape. Landscape, it's a picture of user research methods. Here is one person, one really smart person's inspired attempt to draw a map of a complex space. And I won't go into all the details, but you'll see he's got two primary axes. Data source on one end, attitudinal, how people feel. On the other end, behavioral, what they do. On the other end, on the other scale, approach, qualitative versus quantitative methods. And then he mapped a, 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 the canon of user research methods that we UX people are typically familiar with. So you know, in one quadrant, you see things like focus groups. In another quadrant, you see uh, surveys, and so on and so forth. I find this really fantastic because I, I go to a lot of clients and I say, let's audit your user research program. And you'll often see that they cluster in one quadrant. In other words, they got one blind man or maybe a bunch of blind men that are basically twins or triplets or whatever it might be and they're not covering the other quadrants. And then I use that to say, all right, well, who's doing data mining? Who's doing live A-B testing? Oh, well, we know that there's something going on in our organization. And then you have, an, uh, you have the start of reaching across silos. And that's fantastic. So um, if you look at this, by the way, you do notice that this reflects the bias of the person who put it together. A lot of the quant stuff is kind of squished up in one quadrant. There's really a lot more to that world that he probably wasn't that familiar with or didn't think was as important. Now you could contrast that with this thing called the Trinity strategy that uh, one of the leading guys uh, in web analytics, Avinash Kaushik, has put together. You know, he's got, probably his books are the best-selling books in web analytics. I can't even remember their titles. There's so many of them, and they, they're really quite good. And he was trying to basically create a, a worldview of what they do and how they understand 
users. And you may notice and be slightly offended by the fact that usability and A-B testing and this sort of stuff is, is kind of squished off to the side as well. So this reflects a different bias. No one's going to get this right, but the idea of having a map as a straw man, if nothing else, like these are, is really powerful. A really powerful way to start bridging across those silos. All right, so we've talked a little bit about what you may be doing a year or two from now if you're getting ready to go into the field. Um, what about you 10 years from now when you're uh, a senior person? Maybe it's sooner, maybe it's later. Let's, let's say 10 years from now when you are what are fondly described as decision makers. This is what blows me away. People who are making decisions, who are really doing it with all the kind of lip service they may pay to doing things like user research or research at all, are ultimately making a lot of decisions based on gut or what they see happening at their peer institutions or whatever it might be. When right under their noses and on their tabs are huge pockets of research evidence to help them make decisions. They are operating without a brain. So one of the things I try to do when I, the rare times I talk with people is try to get them in a blue sky mode. And I try to get them to say or to, to think about if you were starting this organization today from scratch and you wanted to make sure your organization was making sound decisions, would your decision making apparatus look anything like it does? In other words, would you really have a bunch of people over there who are known as the omniture people who are playing with the analytics? In fact, you don't even know what they do. You call them the omniture people. That's just a tool. What are they actually doing? And then over there, you've got a bunch of voice of the customer people. And then over there, some others. And you bring in an agency over there, and on and on and on. Would it really look like that? That's how these things happen organically. But you would never, ever plan it that way. And if you're a decision maker, you're in the role of, not, of being able to change that. It doesn't have to be that way if that's your role in the organization. Speaking of terms like omniture, I highly recommend, and I know I shouldn't say this to people in library school, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm one of you, but banning things. You know, we don't like the idea of banning books, and I'm actually saying we should be banning words. But I find that when I talk with people, and uh, th that they use terms that are often crutch terms, that are often very meaningless terms, and it makes them feel comfortable because everything's changing. We never feel like we know enough. We never feel prepared. We're, always, we're talking to people that are not like us. We tend to cling to concepts and words that make us feel comfortable. But those words often are very meaningless and don't lead to good conversations. So if you hear people throwing around terms like omniture or talking specifically about methods, or talking about what their departments are, or what their disciplines do, or even their outcomes, if they're using words like social media layer. None of that involves solving problems. And isn't that what we're trying to do? Is make it, when we are making decisions on behalf of an organization, using all this great evidence we put together, we're trying to fix things. We're trying to identify opportunities. None of these words have anything to do with that. And in fact, I submit that they get in the way. And so I highly recommend, if you can, to, to ban words like this. I've done this. I say in meetings with clients, I'm going to find anyone who uses certain words, a dollar, you throw it in the table. And if I do it, I'm going to throw $5 in the table. Make, make the stakes higher. If you're in Silicon Valley, make them much higher. <laughs> you guys are designers. One of the things you probably already are seeing is that there's a real interest in dashboards. Executives love dashboards. They love dashboards. All they want is a dashboard that'll just take all the stuff they're paying you and everyone else is doing some kind of research to pull it together in one screen and have a bunch of dials. And oh, it's all here, and now I can operate my Fortune 500 by simply clicking on this box until that thing goes up there to 63, and, and I can call it a day. <laughs> all right. Do it. Do it. If you can, give them this. This is a failed metaphor. It's broken, but it represents progress. If you can get them to at least say, yes, I can't keep track of all the stuff you guys are doing, can we put it together in some way? 
all right, whether it's a dashboard or, or some other visual metaphor, or non-visual metaphor for that matter, if you can put it together in one place, that will be really perfect for, for at least a certain stage of development. You'll get them to start seeing that, all right, there's a lot to this. In fact, there's so much to it that I really can't put it all in one dashboard. And then the metaphor will start to fall apart. You'll start seeing things like, well, dials work really well with quantitative stuff, potentially, but not with our, our task analysis reports or whatever it might be. We have stuff that, that's not so quantitative. How do we represent that? And then these things have to tie together, as I've been saying. How do we, we tie together our task analysis with our, our field study report when we really need to kind of combine them? And, and how do we represent how these things change over time? You can see that metaphors fall apart. But that's OK, because that's an educational process. It's short-term pain with long-term gain. So if you can do anything like a dashboard to start putting it together in one place, you're going to be in much better shape along the path to true enlightenment. And that ultimately means I, I hope you're going to be in a position to win it. I hope what I've talked about today gives you the sense that there's opportunity, that there are organizations that are figuring this stuff out, that see that just because you've invested in user research, it doesn't work unless you break it out of the silos and you make it flexible, supple, the ability to connect it in ways that lead to true insight. And I think you know, the organizations that do this type of synthesis, and I hope I've given you a few starting ideas down that path, are going to be the ones that achieve true insight. They're going to be the ones that you know, destroy their competitors, if that's what you're in for, if that's your sort of thing, or at least do good things. And I really think that you guys are the ones to do it. Good luck. Thanks.